Thank you so much for the kind introduction, and thank you very much for having me in this world, one of the world's largest maritime conferences. It is my honor to share my view with you today. I changed a little bit at the last minute to my slides, so if you need the new slides, let me get your email and I will send you the new slides. Today I'm going to talk about three things. First, nuclear power is rising. Second, many uh, registers in the world are defining the safety requirements for nuclear power. Third, many registers or classification organizations are dominating SMR technologies. As you know, back in July, I am announced Net Zero 2050, which, is, which will be a historic milestone that has brought a lot of changes. In 2019, as you heard from Clarkson Research, Ellen's fuel shifts will help us reduce CO2 emission by 50% by 2050. That was our prediction, prediction, but everything has changed since the announcement from the IMO. New builds should be 100% eco-friendly shifts, and you heard alternative fuels today, including ethanol, methanol, hydrogen, and ammonia, and now we have to add nuclear power to the list. Nuclear power ship is called new ships. Many are interested in them because SMR's safety is increasing, and when SMR is used for ships, it can offer economic feasibility, and it can enhance speed. And safety codes are under development, and we will see a number of safer SMRs in the future. According to enclosed Article 23, bilateral and trilateral agreements between and among countries around the world are increasing, so it is opening up a new era for nuclear ships. And ship owners are also paying their attention to the current trend. If you look at the picture, the Y axle represents COPEX and OPEX, and X axle represents operation. And Kyrian fuel will be two to three times more expensive than existing fuels. But SMR fuel ships compared to diesel and LNG. LNG will be up to five times cheaper. That is why we are calling SMR fueled ships the next generation new ships. If you look at the right hand side, Y axle represents dollar costing for hydrogen production one kilogram of hydrogen production. So solar power will cost five times more than nuclear power in terms of production. So nuclear power is emerging as your new fuel because it is safer and it is cheaper. So you may ask why SMRs are safer. I'm going to answer the question based on this plot of Professor Hyeongchol Bang. X represents micro, micro and Y axle represents output. 
the power is increasing, as you can see in this graph, and it is divided by multi-core. Every single element here will not be burned, even without external stimulation. Let's apply this the same logic to large nuclear power plants. It is exposed to the risk of melting down, but if it, it gets smaller, I mean, if it is a SMR, without the risk of a meltdown, we can create power at a cheaper price. Now we are seeing micro Utah MR. It offers five times less output compared to SMR, and it doesn't uh, present any risks of meltdown or radioactivity. So this might offer a promising solution to the shipping industry. IMA and OECD recently announced a certain aspect of SMR. According to their announcement, there are about 100 projects under development, and 20 out of them can be applied to the shipbuilding and shipping industries. And they can be divided into four types broadly. One is PWR. It requires water, and China, Russia, and Korea are leaders here. Second is salt. It is called S MSR, Molten Salt Reactor. If you enrich uranium, you can create a nuclear power. And the U.S. is adding chloride here. And Denmark is adding fluoride. And the U.S. and the Netherlands are leading this area. The third is LFR, Sweden, Russia, Italy, the UK, and Korea are developing this part. The last one is sodium fast reactor. It is related to heat pipe reactor. It is in the form of heat pipe reactor. It, can, it is under development in the US for application in the maritime industry. These four types of new fuel have their own safety requirements. Professor Kodaris offered analysis on the safety requirements of these four types. And he said most of the accidents in the nuclear power industry can be defined as nuclear submarines and oil tankers. And oil tankers are directly related to chemical explosion. So today, I'd like to tell you how we can define these requirements for these two uh, four types of nuclear power. First, nuclear explosion in the nuclear power industry. Maybe what some of you saw this movie Oppenheimer. Let's take a look at the picture on the right. Uranium enrichment ratio is represented by X axle, and Y axle represents criticality. And this blue line is criticality graph. The higher the criticality is, the higher the possibility that nuclear explosion will happen. And military grade nuclear submarines are fueled by HBU. The critical mass here is only dozens of kilograms. So if nuclear materials are placed in the submarine body, nuclear explosion could happen. And for commercial ships, only a nuclear a tw less than 20% of uranium enrichment can be used. If it goes over that threshold, the critical mass will be about 400 kilograms, and that can be 
uh, installed or mounted on a rocket, and it cannot be used for any military attacks or operational attacks. So we are talking about LEU. 5% of enriched uranium is used, and the fourth generation of nuclear power plant is using molten sodium reactor, MSR, and it is somewhere between 20% and 50% of enriched uranium. In the past, Russia operated submar nuclear submarines fueled by enriched uranium, and it was those submarines were refueled at seas, and nuclear materials were approached by the body when uh, the ship body is shaken or move or is unsettled by waves, that could increase the risk of explosion. That is why Russia shifted its position and decided to refuel their nuclear submarines on ground and on shore. The U.S. is using 90% of enriched uranium, and nuclear submarines of the U.S. fueled by nuclear power. Its life expectancy or life cycle is longer than the conventional submarines. But for icebreaker, more than 20% of enriched uranium cannot be used. That is why Russia brought their submarines to dry, per, a dry harbor, a dry deck, because they decided that for commercial shifts, that number is not high enough. As you can see here, highly enriched uranium, it offers more than 40 years of life cycle, and criticality is almost one. But when you use 5% of enrichment, nuclear fuel should be replaced every two years. If you use 20%, the refueling cycle goes up to 20 years. So SMR is too dangerous to be used in the humanitarian industry, and it can also generate too much waste. That is why SMR is not that popular. In contrast, the blue dots here, they represent fast reactor. They burn uranium at 280 degrees, and that, comp that supplement plutonium-239. So the intensity of the flame can last at the same level for as long as 40 years. So it can offer more promising solution to the maritime industry because you don't have to refuel or replace your nuclear fuel for up to 40 years. So most of the research focus has been on fast reactor in recent years. A fast reactor includes MSR, L liquid FR, FR and gas FR was found to be safe, but it is too big, according to some people. So I'd like to on, elaborate on that. So today I'm going to focus on MSR and LFR. MSR was developed by Terra Power, founded by Bill Gates. And Coal Power, a uh, uh, UK organization, is using that for maritime industry in building ships. It is important to note that chemical explosion and nuclear explosion cannot be ruled out as a possibility. I'm going to show you a short, a short video. Total surprise. I was expecting a little bit of splattering, but what I got was like a full-on powerful explosion. 
Look at the cavitation bubbles on the glass, and it just shattered it and blew that fish tank glass across my yard. The Bill Gates Group is using MSR, but it offers a risk of chemical explosion. And MSR is not likely to be cooled down naturally. So let's assume that there is an accident. You have to manually emit, cool down MSR. But so when it, it is mounted on a ship, it could cause a sloshing effect when there is a sea motion. So you always have to consider there is a possibility or a risk of explosion. Next is heat pipe reactors. This is called sodium fast reactor, SFR. Let me show you another video. As you know, sodium, when it reacts with water, it could cause a chemical explosion. Could you click the play button here? So sodium fast reactor also carries a risk of chemical explosions. So when there is a volume in SFR, it could lead to a nuclear explosion. So aren't they too dangerous? Einstein left at this important, uh, famous quote. He said, people and human beings tend to repeat their mistakes, the same mistakes. So the answer lies here. So there has been a review of fast reactors in AVS in the US said lead reactor is the safest in Lina. The classification organization in Italy said lead reactor is the safest because it and it is more it's the most economical because it doesn't require any replacement for over 40 years and it was already used for the Soviet Union's nuclear submarines and it can the lead can be sunk down to the bottom of the sea. And the Raisin Science Technology University collaborated with DMB, said sealer is the safest. So lead fast reactor is getting more popular because it can ensure safety, not only offshore, but onshore. Last May, LFR, manufactured by Nucleo, was discussed at this negotiating table attended by French minister, uh, French friend, uh, president, and the French president said, "France will build LFR plants." France has been strongly pushing forward LFR. It has the most advanced technologies when it comes to sodium. But since the Fukushima nuclear leakage accident, they have been staying away from LFR. They have been staying away from nuclear power plants. But this time, they decided to build more LFR power plants. For the shipbuilding and shipping industries, natural circulation, LFR, and whole life, and the whole life cycle can be covered by LFR. So it is a prevailing thought that LFR 
is the best alternative and solution. There are three technologies that are competing. One is nu that is nu uh, one is nuclear, co-developed by Italy and the UK and chosen by President Macron. The second thing is sailor. And micro Uranus, which is a Korean one that is being under that is under development by cooperation between Korea and Norway Norwegian company and Lloyd. These three technologies are competing in the market. Nuclear offers 15 to 20 years of a lifetime, sailor, 30 years, and micro Uranus, 40 years, the longest. That is why Norwegian Group and Lloyd proposed cooperation. This technology has been developed by Seoul National University for the past 30 years. And UNIS and KAIST and SNU work together to refine this technology over the past 10 years. And specifically in the last four years, the endeavor had accelerated. And in uni within the UNIS, we will build a lab for further facilitating this endeavor. It is 11 meter high, and this, SM, this reactor can be mounted on a large container ships, and it is without any risk of meltdown. In, under the worst case scenario, radioactivity will not be leaked outside the reactor. So it doesn't require any emergency evacuation. So compared to the, the other two, LFR, this one is most competitive and safest. I don't have much time left. So I'd like to conclude my presentation by showing you this video. So please click the play button down here. This micro reactor can be manufactured at a plant and nuclear power can be fuel, uh, fueled here and pilot tests can be done at the plant level as well. And it can be it can be loaded on a truck and the truck goes to a hover. And here we are using plug and play system. Once it is mounted or fuel a ship, the ship doesn't need to refuel itself for the next or for the following 40 years. And calibration operation can be remotely controlled or remotely done once every two years. And once the fuel is filled, it will be welded. So there is no risk of liquids. So it is safe in terms of uh, security as well. Once it is decommissioned, once the ship is decommissioned, the fuel can be recycled. So highly active waste will be disposed and medium level waste will be brought taken to Gyeongju treatment facility. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I would like to talk about going green with alternative powered engines. I am Youngwoo Kim from KR. Thank you for inviting me to this conference. 
There are many regulatory issues surrounding the industry. I would not, however, focus on regulations, but I would like to talk about what, uh, what kind of activities are going on regarding the alternative engines. First, if you look at the top middle graph and the graph on the left side, you can see that there's a growing in growing amount of carbon accumulate on the earth and the earth's temperature is gradually growing. Even without looking at the graph, you will know already that the global warming is uh, speeding up and the earth's temperature increase is also being accelerated. On the top right side, you see another graph. This year in summer, it was very hot in Korea. In from June till August of 2023. This is the level of temperature across the world. In June 2023, June has the highest level of temperature in history. If the current trend continues, then the average temperature increase of 1.5 Celsius degree will happen in December 2034. Of course, we will see what happens when we reach 2034, but based on the data we have now, we expect that the 1.5 Celsius degree will be realized in December 2034. This is why many countries across the world are taking various measures and proposing targets to prevent such a temperature increase. Let's have a look at the maritime industry. There are international regulations put by IMO. There are re regional regulations by, for example, EU and the US. As you see here, EEDI and EEXI are already being applied to the industry. And from May 2027, the data collection system and LCA guidelines will be applied. Specific methods of implementation is under discussion, but 2027 will be a very critical period of time in terms of compliance with the regulation. And EU ETS, fuel EU maritime are going to be the very important regulations we have to consider. And the U.S. has similar regulations announced. EU and U.S. are leading the regulatory changes, which will be followed by other regions and countries across the world. Then the EU MRV data is here to compare energy efficiency of various fuels. The data after 2023 was predicted based on the data we have as of 2022. If the situation of 2022 continues, then grade C will take up around 70 percent. Uh, and if we continue our current way of operation, the number of vessels with efficiency of grade C or higher will dramatically decrease. You may take your own operational improvement measures, but first of all, you have to consider how to change your fuels. For now, LNG and biodiesel are being discussed as alternatives. And in the far future, green fuels will be used more to achieve energy efficiency level of grade C or higher and to also meet the GHG reduction targets. Then let's have a look at the propulsion sector. In order to achieve the GHG reduction, these activities are being carried out in propulsion sector. First of all, this is the Clarkson's data. This diagram was pre announced by Clarkson in October 2023. Except for LNG, these are the alternative fuels expected to be adopted uh, to the vessels. Based on GT, 
38% will be taken up by alternative fuels, and LNG takes up 67% and methanol 25%. So far, LNG and methanol are the main options, uh, main uh, alternative fuels. Recently, an order was placed for ammonia vessel. Then, in order to choose, make a good choice of the alternative fuels, there are key considerations. First, we have to reduce emissions, we have to reduce penalties, and we have to see if these alternative fuel technologies are stable technologies and future-proof technologies. We have to look at infrastructure challenges and the amount of fuel supply. We have to also consider the ship design changes and engine availability. We have to consider these points when we adopt alternative fuels. Biodiesel is the easiest one. There are issues like viscosity and micro uh, growth in fuel, but biodiesel is the easiest alternative fuel we can use now. And regarding the use of biodiesel, all stakeholders say that they can accept biodiesel, but if you look at the footnote below there, uh, there are some comments that if you use biodiesel, lifetime of components could be reduced. But uh, it is true that we can use engines uh, continuously when we adopt biodiesel. And GS Cartex also is going through a demonstration project to use biodiesel on the vessels. And two-stroke DF engines can be adopted by vessels. On the right side, you see different configurations, different types of engines, beginning from LNG, methanol, and LPG, and ammonia, and someday hydrogen. These fuels can be employed by the two-stroke DF engines. For now, methanol and ammonia have received the highest level of attention because they their fuel supply system could be similar to biodiesel because they can be supplied in the form of a liquid. So the existing crew and seafarers would feel familiar with using methanol or ammonia. Of course, we have to consider the properties and characteristics of methanol and ammonia, so we have to consider safety issues, but basically the basic concept of using methanol and ammonia are similar to the concept of using diesel. If we choose to use LNG, LNG DF methane sleep is a very essential issue we have to discuss. If you look at MEPC 80 meeting minutes and fuel EU Maritime Annex 2, they described the specific figures for LNG methane uh, sleep. On the right side, for different types of LNG engine, you can see that there would be methane slip. Currently, regulatory discussion is going on, and you have to calculate the cost you may have to spend. And if the methane slip increases, you will have to spend more regulatory cost. For example, that if you calculate the methane slip to the amount of CO2, that will stand at around 2 to 3 uh, percent of increase in terms of the cost. So you, you will have to spend more regulatory cost if you have methane sleep. And GWP 100 reference is here in the table. Each country has different levels of GWP 100 reference. So we have to, it depends on the regulation. Engine manufacturers also understand the situation. And they're tr they, many of the engine manufacturers are saying that we have reduced the level of methane sleep by using, for example, EGR. So we have to address the issue of methane sleep. And 
it's not that all vessels will be able to use alternative fuel. According to the table here, you will see that vessels over 70,000 DWT and vessels over with over 10,000 kilowatt um, power will be able to use alternative fuels. It also depends on the ship design, how the ship is manufactured, built in the by the shipyards. Depending on the ship size and engine power, um, they will be able to use alternative fuel or not. Then let's have a look at timeline. LNG has already been commercialized, but it took for about um, 10 years for us to commercialize LNG. For green methanol, it'll take from three to five years if, it, if the methanol is produced or the E ammonia is based on hydrogen, that it'll take from five to 10 years for commercialization. And have a look at the graph on the right side for green meth methanol. By 2028, this is the amount of fuel needed for the methanol. As you see, as time goes up until 2028, the, the demand for methanol will significantly increase. And by 2028, we guess that methanol bunkering infrastructure will be further uh, developed to meet the demand. And when will be the time when the green methanol and E ammonia will have the similar level of needs and demands? It will be around 2030. By around 2030, the proportion of green methanol and E ammonia in the market will increase further. And even if you install the alternative, even if you install the relevant engine on the vessel, it does not mean that you can use alternative fuel right away because you have to address many issues. In the case of LNG, there are mechanical issues we have to consider. As you might have experienced, LNG gives some impact on the nozzle. Also, you have to deal with some residual heat issues as well. For now, design has been improved and field testing has been conducted, and many issues have been solved. Methanol gives us similar issues. So you need to place shield like this, or if you operate the vessels with diesel mode for about two months, then you have to replace the existing methanol nozzle with a dummy nozzle. And mechanical issues are supposed to uh, appear if we use DF engine with ammonia or methanol. So the ship operators, ship designers, and other relevant parties need to discuss with each other about how to address the issues, including mechanical issues. And the size of the nozzle uh, that will be installed in the mask vessel is this size. This is a very big nozzle. In order to conduct repair and maintenance on the nozzle, you have to use a crane. So in order to carry the nozzle and in order to transfer them to the maintenance site, you have to use a crane or you, need, you will need to extend the rail to safely carry them to the maintenance site. Methanol and LNG are considered uh, clean fuel, and many people think that the filter will not be clogged. But if you look at the picture here, 
in LNG and many alternative fuel lines, clogging could be created and that will delay the operation or testings. So before commissioning the engine, you have to uh, look at the filter or you can install some jigs or equipments to prevent clogging of the filter. In methanol, LNG, and ammonia fueled vessels, we'll be using the engines controlled by the electronic or the system. So software will become very important. There are concerns about using software for the engine. But you may experience unexpected situation while uh, operating the ships. Then you will have to update the software and reflect the feedback from, from the site. And shipping companies that receive the initially developed uh, software and engines are highly likely to experience various engine issues, including software issues. And when we use alternative fuel engine, we have to be aware of the possible leakage. If such a leakage takes place, a fire could take place, or in worst case, a human life could be taken by such incident. So we have to make it sure that crew and the seafarers are able to respond to the leakage uh, problem or accident. And many new functions are being applied to the engines, not just EGR, SCR. And another new method has been created to uh, put water in methanol, for example. But while applying these new functions, we might experience um, errors, trials and errors, and it'll take time for us to solve all these problems. So it's important that shipyards, uh, shipping companies, and ship operators need to share information about their experience with the new functions. Another important aspect is training. There are statutory or mandatory trainings and practical trainings provided by engine companies. We have to receive such trainings. In the case of mandatory trainings, crew members must receive the training required to deal with the alternative fuels and practical trainings provided by engine companies are also useful for crews and seafarers to prevent any problems. And shipping companies, for shipping companies who will make efforts to achieve the GHG target, we are helping them. We help them identify the energy efficiency of their vessels and work on the design issues as well. For each step, so you need to take a step-by-step -step, uh, approach. You also need to set ESG strategies to respond to the upcoming GHG reduction issues. In summary, we are going through climate crisis and the earth temperature is rising. Many countries are announcing their own regulations to reduce GHG and manufacturers are doing their best to to comply with such regulations and biofuel, including LNG, methanol, and ammonia, and DF engine portfolio are also uh, increasing and are widening. And there are many issues we have to address. So many interested parties or stakeholders need to share uh, all those issues together. And KR recommends that you have to 
establish your own uh, ESG plans and strategies for net zero goals. And we are open to your uh, request and your request for support. Thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm the director of Engine Research Center of HD Heavy Industries. It's my privilege to present my ideas at this important conference. Thank you for having me today. Today, I'm going to talk about the development of methanol engine and zero carbon, carbon fuel engine for greenhouse gas emission regulations. And I will also talk about virtual fuel. This is the content of my presentation. First, I'm going to give you some background. And then it will be followed by development characteristics of a ship engine and need for BPD and methanol engine development in Hyundai heavy industries. And I will conclude my presentation with the future plan. Greenhouse gas related regulations have been discussed enough. So let me be brief here. The number of relevant regulations and laws are, is, are increasing, is increasing. And the laws and regulations have increased for a short period of time. Only a few years ago, LNG would be enough to meet the requirements, but there have been too many changes for the last few years. Regulations have gotten stricter, as you can see in the graph, HD, Hyundai Group Engine Development Division has to consider the regulations when it develops new engines. There are many available solutions and options for now, but everything comes down to change of fuels. Without changing fuels, we cannot meet the new regulations. It's important to develop new engines, but changing fuels will not be all cure. So we have to increase, we need a new technology to increase fuel efficiency at the same time. BPD, it includes a long list of technologies, but simply put, it is uh, technology based on simulation as well as based on data. People in this industry has extensive no have extensive knowledge of this, but if you think again why PPD is important, the answer is just simple. Car's life cycle is only 6,000 hours and specific specifically prototypes of cars, only f uh, as many as 500 to 600 prototypes are produced. But we are producing only one large prototype of engines for our customers. Once we create a prototype based on simulation, the immediate next step is mass production. So compared to the car industry, you may imagine much simulation would require for the ship building, and you're correct, as greenhouse gas emission regulations become more rigid. And to support new engines, simulation is becoming an increasingly more important, but we need more than data. Himsen, and, um, Himsen is a brand of HD heavy industries. It already has a complete lineup of dual fuel engines. It works, it serves as a platform to develop a methanol fuel engine, but this is not enough. This is not sufficient, so we need BPD 
for new engine development. So this shows workload. In the August step, workload is relatively less, and once you reach mass production stage, workload will the curve goes up sharply. Before shipbuilding and shipping, a diverse range of models are needed. So more endeavor to reduce the gap will be needed constantly. So HD Hyundai Heavy Industries introduced and launched Himsen engine in 2012. It took 60 years to develop a model, but the development period went down to three years later. And the line of creation took six years, and it offered six different models. And each model took two years to be developed, but the methanol engine took only six months. But the development team says it's easier said than done because the team, it, they were the ones who developed the engine. But after all, the development period was significantly shortened. The methanol as a fuel, I'm not talking about the chemical properties of methanol. Methanol, methanol as a fuel is a new type of fuel for shipping and shipbuilding industries. And that was what we knew when we first developed this type of engines. But thermal release was much less than other alternative fuels, but vapor rate, its vapor rate presented a challenge in combustion. So we consider that property when we developed methanol engines, and I will elaborate on that on later slide. And we have to take a balance. Advantages can serve as disadvantages, but sometimes your worries and concerns will not be worries and concerns anymore, and stocks will be released. That's obvious, but we were able to see stocks was reduced because of the residual thermal, but as you know, green fuel is the way we will move forward. H3 is the basic platform for methanol engine development. And heavy fuel oil, HFO, MDO, and MGO is all capable. And this engine, this methanol engine, can meet the requirements of IMO tier 3. What is notable is that we are using e dual fuel in injection pump, and it is mechanically pumped, but it is at the same time can be controlled by electronically. And methanol was developed to use a common rail. And LNG TF is auto cycle. As you already heard from a previous speaker, methanol slip is one of the most important issues and that could cause the biggest problem in auto cycle. So when we first came up with the concept of design, we considered the advantage of methanol engines in terms of meth uh, slip methanol. We can offer advantage in terms of NOx release as well. Once you have a port injection, so much shock could happen. Here you have to consider the methanol can exist at a room temperature. There is something called dwell. So micropile is used to inject diesel, and it is followed by combustion, and last methanol is injected. So after all, 
methanol. Gives higher vapor rate because of a latent heat. Methanol could stop combustion, or the combustion engine room, which is hot enough, can offer unstable combustion because methanol is injected too late. So we have to control the unstable combustion. And it, this will determine, your control will determine whether you have stable combustion or unstable combustion. So timing is the key to ensure combustion. Next, heat release rate. This is a conventional diesel compared to long dual. dual. So Duel has better heat release. So you may suggest zero dual is the best, but that's not the case because it could interfere with methanol combustion. Since 2019, we were prepared for development of methanol engine and new GHD regulations of IMO, but we didn't expect that the regulations will get stricter much fast, much earlier than we expected. We are using electronic fuel pumps. This allows us to use or uh, adjust the pumping. The methanol is using common rail, so it offers better efficiency and offers better uh, heat efficiency. Next, smoke. There is only small amount of smoke, so it releases small amount of NOx. As I said earlier, we should strike a balance. And this new engine can, this new development methodology is contributing to reduce NOx release. Ekmil Musk, this is a new ship builder. It has taken an aggressive approach so in keeping up with their efforts. We have developed this engine, and we are proud to say that we made it at least a contribution to this endeavor. In Europe, Laura sailed from Korea to Europe, and there was a much fanfare, there was much fanfare, and the chair of the European Commission was also attended the ceremony. In DF1, HD Heavy Industries received an order of over 200 DF1. And as you can see on the graph, the order is increasing. And this is an example of VPD, vibration, endurance, fatigue. Everything is used for simulation. Let me give you the leading two, uh, two leading examples. Anyone can do this, but no one can actually put their words into action. Once we reach the stage of mass production, you have to consider this. To meet the different needs of ship owners, you have to build a wide range of products in small volumes. So you have to do simulation for every single product. It will cost you a lot. That is why BPD is important, because it can give you meta, meta models. So all you have to do is enter certain numbers, and the result is the engine performance values. So it took one and a half years only, but that doesn't mean that we worked 24-7 without uh, with losing much sleep. 
So BPD allows you to find the best position, best results. So you can make more with it less. So tests, uh, the number of tests can be reduced by 50%. And at the same time, we could find the most optimized methodology. And basic design concept, a uh, design of concept very important. So all you have to do is to enter basic numbers and values to predict the performance. This is a part of front engineering, and this is also a part of a VPD methodology. A peak end bearing is very important for lubrication system. And Himsen engines include different lineups and more than 20,000 Himsen engines have been manufactured. So by utilizing all these different models, we created a meta model. So again, you can enter basic data and what will come out is uh, an estimated performance for a new engine. It will help you reduce cost, save you cost. So when we develop a new ammonia or uh, methanol engines, we can reduce dramatically the development periods. Next is our future plan. We launched a methanol engine last year. For the later half of this year, we will launch another model, H2 engine, and they will complete our methanol engine lineup. So we can meet the needs of large commercial ships and small feed liners. And PAT is scheduled for December. Next year, we are scheduled to launch ammonia engine and for the third quarter we will apply for a type approval we are also working on hydrogen engine uh, our uh, completion rate is currently 30 percent and pure hydrogen engine our target date is 2025 ammonia is expected to release a large amount of NOx not only methane sleep, but N2O are very important, so it requires your awareness. M2O, so we have to reach somewhere between M2O and NOx. Hydrogen engines. It sounds like a novel technology, but hydrogen, hydrogen is becoming a common fuel for vehicles. For low speed and mid speed shipping and operation, hydrogen com is combusted faster. So that is what we need to control. So this is the summary and conclusions. GHG regulations are getting stricter. So as an engine builder, we need to cope with the stricter regulations. Once again, HD Hyundai Heavy Industries has, a, has an extensive portfolio. You know, a portfolio allows us a meta model there will shorten development periods. So we will going we are going to develop ammonia engines and hydrogen engines. And I truly believe engine builders can contribute to saving the earth. And the engine development business division will continue. Yes. Nice to meet you all. I am from Korea Petroleum Quality and Distribution Authority. I am Chegon Kim. 
in the previous presentation, you learned about the current status of engine development. My presentation is about the biofuels that can be immediately applied to the existing vessels along with the prospect of such biofuels. In the existing vessels, biodiesel can be applied. Secondly, bio heavy oil can replace bunker oil, bunker C oil as liquid biofuel. Biogas-based bio-LNG is also available in the maritime sector. In Korea, biodiesel, bio-heavy oil, and bio-LNG can be applied to the existing vessels. I will also explain about their potential. In Korea, among renewable energy sources, bioenergy takes up around 31%. 31% of renewable energy is bioenergy, which includes solid bioenergy, gaseous and liquid bioenergy. Most of the bioenergy consists of liquid bioenergy, wood pellets take up the large portion, bio-heavy oil is used for biofuel-based uh, power generation, and biogas is used for city gas supply and um, vehicle fuel. Biodiesel, bio-heavy oil, and biogas can be applied to the existing vessels, of course, In terms of quality, we need to make some adjustment and improve the quality. In the Korean transportation sector, diesel, natural gas, gasoline, LPG, and jet fuel can be used for vessels, biodiesel, natural gas, LPG can be applied. Now in Korea, as an alternative fuel, biodiesel is being adopted under RFS system of the Korean government. 3.5% of the fuel for cars consists of biodiesel. From 2012, biogas has been used for city gas and bus fuel. And bio-DME, which uh, is equivalent of LPG, is under R&D process. Biojet fuel is for aviation sector, which is also under R&D step. Recently, the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Energy announced its national biofuel policy for Korea. In the maritime sector, biofuel-based vessels went through demonstration project. And all laws and regulations regarding biofuel will be completely announced by 2025 for uh, ship owners. This is what was announced by U Europe EMSE. There are various types of maritime biofuels, including heavy oil fuel and MGO and many other types of fuels. There are various fuel oils and LNG. So the maritime biofuel can be categorized into replaced um, distillate fuel oils and liquefied natural gas. 
FAME, which is in another words biodiesel, HVO with higher fuel quality are being commercialized and are being produced across the globe. And FD diesel and lignocellulosic biomass is going through R&D. So this is also, this could be a type of biodiesel as well. And methanol is also one of the alternative fuel candidates. SVO, used as bunker oil, is another candidate. Biofuel oil belongs to SVO. The bean oil can be combined with waste oil and can be used as a fuel. And lignocellulosic uh, biofuel can be also used. And sorvalous oil will also become a valuable biogas-based LBM is also going to be a valuable. If you liquefy CBM, you can get this oil. So these are the basic categories of biofuel. FME, the biodiesel, is being reviewed as the biofuel the most by the, the global ship owners and shipping companies. SVO is being produced in Korea. Biodiesel and SVO went through demonstration project in the existing vessel. Ship to ship demonstration is going on. Compared to the existing MGO, this is the baseline. If you go forward towards LCO, advanced biofuel has great impact in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Forestry residue-based biomass also exists and they have great effectiveness in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I guess the IMO could give you higher carbon incentives if you use uh, the alternative fuels with greater impact of greenhouse gas reductions. Here you see the table and there are blue letters that says 10. If it says 10, it means that they are immediately available. FAME and HVO are being produced. And HVO gives you higher fuel quality, but it, it is also expensive. In the case of methanol, OCI Global is commercially producing that fuel in Korea. Biomethanol-related R&D is going on, uh, trying to attract investment. The government created the Clean Energy Initiatives, which is also related to the biomethanol fuel development. In the case of SVO, SVO is available for now in Korea as well. Part of the biogas fuels are also available now. The global market is created around biofuel, HVO, biomethanol, biomethanol, SVO, and biomethane are commercially available. The cheapest one is FAME and SVO. SVO is the cheapest one, followed by FAME, HVO.
And as for biofuel, some of the biofuel is based on biobas. Depending on which feed stock you use, you will have different effectiveness in greenhouse gas uh, reduction. One of the disadvantages of biofuel would be that feed stocks are agricultural residues and waste oils. Rather, you need to choose the right feed stock for biofuel to generate great impact in greenhouse gas reduction. This is the R&D activities going on in Korea regarding biofuel technology. If you use crop-based feed stock, EU is not recommending companies to use this kind of feed stock, but you can use forestry residue based biofuel. Those uh, biofuels can be applied to the existing vessels. In Korea, we conducted R&D on liquid biofuels. Biodiesel, bio-heavy oil, and SVO are under commercial production stage in Korea. As for biodiesel, there are eight companies in Korea that are producing biodiesel. Production capacity for biodiesel in Korea is 1.07 million tons. 800,000 tons of that is being used by cars. In Korea, general public, the usually car owners are using biodiesel as part of their uh, fuel for their cars. We have also imported part of the biodiesel as marine biofuel. Biodiesel is immediately available. Second type of fuel is biogas. In Korea and in many countries across the world, biogas is created through anaerobic digestion of organic uh, waste and then you liquefy this and use it as um, LNG. In Korea, there are only eight sites that can produce liquefied biomethane. So in Korea, we have a very limited amount of uh, biogas resources. So the potential to create LNG from biogas is quite small in Korea. Next one is bio-heavy oil that can replace the existing bunker oil. In Korea, bio-heavy oil is mostly used for power plants. They are used for running boilers and running turbines to create uh, power, create electricity and for power generation. But in Korea, we are going through demonstration projects to use bio-heavy oil for uh, vessels. We are combining various types of bio-heavy oil feed stocks in the demonstration phase. And we need to make improvement in terms of the uh, lubricant, uh, lubrication. And HVO is turned into paraffine and can be used as a fuel. HVO can be used for cars compared to light oil. HVO is 2.5 times more expensive than the light oil.
So HVO is a feasible idea, but it is uh, highly priced compared to other types of biofuel. Next one is biomethanol and FD diesel. They are from waste lumber or waste wood materials. Currently in Korea, our technology level for bioethanol is at around level 5 if the highest level is 10 or 11. Many Korean companies have been actively participating in the development activities for biomethanol or FD diesel. We can develop FD diesel by using the existing technologies and it will take about five years to commercially produce FD diesel. And this is the summary slide. In Korea, all the current road biofuels can be shifted to, to be used as fuel for maritime sector and aviation sector. So if we make a little bit of improvement with the current road biofuels, then we can use them for maritime and aviation sector. But uh, we are making improvement in terms of the bunkering. And I guess that from now on, in one to two years from now on, we will be able to commercially produce and apply many of the biofuels to the maritime sector. By using biofuel for cars and vehicles, we are reducing CO2 emission of around 20,000 uh, um, or 2 million tons. And I guess that if we use such biofuels for maritime sector, we will be able to reduce much larger amount of CO2 emission. Biodiesel and SVO are immediately available and applicable to the vessels, to the existing vessels. So we're going through demonstration to verify this concept. By from, for example, the beginning of 2025, we will be able to apply them immediately, immediately to the vessels. And for other types of oil, including HVO and FD diesel and biomethanol, R&D projects are being proceeded with in Korea. And the government and the businesses in the sector will make preparations so that we will be able to use many different types of biofuel. And in terms of biofuel, we will be using non-edible feedstocks as well. And the government will fully support this process. Thank you for your attention.